file for a patent on your invention, can it pass the obviousness test or is it going to be rejected? This video is going to talk all about the non-obviousness standard of patentability and how it's applied during the examination process. So stick around. The first thing to understand is that examination only occurs with non-provisional patent applications. Now there's two ways to start the patent process. You can start first with the formal non-provisional patent application and that's the one that waits in line at the USPTO for examination. Whereas you can also start with a provisional patent application. You, you file this provisional patent application at the United States Patent and Trademark Office, but it's only a placeholder. It's not formally examined in any sort of way. It only lasts for one year. It expires at the end of the year. And then you have to file that non-provisional application that will actually be examined. Provisionals are great for startups, and it's how I typically work with my clients to start the patent process. But this is going to be relative to the examination that occurs on non-provisional patent applications. Applications. You've filed your non-provisional patent application and then it's just going to wait in line at the USPTO for one to three years before examination begins. And that's just because it's the government and it's a long line. You're just waiting for your application to come to the top of the pile to get attention from an examiner. So when that happens, the examiner is going to pick up the application and is going to do a prior art search to determine whether what you have claimed is new and non-obvious over the prior art. I'll talk about novelty later on, but let's start with obviousness. When it comes to obviousness, the question is, would it be obvious to one of ordinary skill in the art, that being your average person who works in the technology field of your invention, to come to your invention based on all known prior art that's out there? Now, prior art can really be any sort of technology disclosure. Typically, it's going to be cited as issued patent applications or publications of patent applications, but it really can be anything. It could be a blog post, it could be a YouTube video, a scientific paper, an actual product or a product catalog. Any sort of technology disclosure can be cited as prior art. So before I give a specific example of how obviousness rejections work, if you're getting some value out of this video, please give it a like so you can support the channel and help this video get out to more people. Let me give you a specific example of how an obviousness rejection would work. So let's say your invention is claimed as having elements A, B, C, and D. Okay, so the examiner would do a prior art search and let's say they're not able to find a single piece of prior art that has elements A, B, C, and D but they can find one piece of prior art that has elements A and B in it. It doesn't disclose the other elements, but it only has elements A and B in there. They keep on doing a prior art search, then they find another piece of prior art, the second piece of prior art that has elements C and D. Okay, so what the examiner would do then is say, well, okay, we're aware, of, we're aware of this first piece of prior art, we're aware of the second piece of prior art. It would be obvious to combine these two references to come to A, B, C, and D, which is your invention that has elements A, B, C, and D. The other requirement of patentability is that it is novel or new. So check out this video, click on this, and find out about novelty rejections as opposed to obvious re rejections. Or click on this video here, this talks about how to actually respond to novelty rejections or obviousness rejections. Also, be sure to like the video so uh, more people can see it and uh, help support this channel. Thank you.